Hello folks and welcome to the show. We're back again today. We didn't come out Monday. We were too busy. We were just a bit lazy on Bank Holiday Monday. We had enough to be doing. Nah, there's no, there's, there's no laziness. We just felt we'd have more time to give you a quality packed show today. That's all there is. No such thing as laziness, Shane. You know? That's a fine narrative. Just a reminder, we're brought to you by uh, orgaretro.com. Use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. But look, we do have a load coming on the show today. We, like you said, we had that little bit of extra time to sort of digest what happened at the weekend. It was the first round of the league in the hurling, second round of the league in the football. So we'll come to all of that. And I'm just wondering, though, after, you know, just watching the what we saw at the weekend and knowing that, you know, the I suppose Limerick manager John Kiley had said that they have 46 players at the moment. Tipperary will probably look to cut their panel. They said it would be towards maybe the end of January, start of February, that type. Like, do you think managers, will they be doing this dispassionately or will there be an element of trying to be a bit careful with players and whatever? Do you, like, do you think managers focus on it too much? Just like, look, we'll keep an eye on you, Grand, we'll get you again. It's funny because if you talk to some managers, they say that this is the worst time of the year and these are the worst conversations that they have and they'll be quite emotive about it. And then you chat to other managers and just be like, no, that's just the way it is, you know, with the, with the pick panel for the year. So it's kind of a lot to do with, you know, what the, what the manager's approach is. But uh, I, do, I do think, particularly with certain age profiles, a lot of the time it's going to be younger lads that are going to be let go, lads that have maybe got a chance to cut their teeth and maybe will go off and be part of a development squad. I think Clare have a development squad this year, actually, um, a f- kind of a feeder squad that I don't think they had before. Um, so you have to, you're definitely playing the long game with those guys because they're following the same S&C programs as the guys that are on the, the main county panel and you're hoping they'll slip back in. So, ah, uh, I don't know. I definitely don't think you'd want to, uh, I don't know if I was doing it, I wouldn't want to be, you know, just be like, you know, you know, the old Homer Simpson, uh, Little League football, you're cut. Lewis, you're cut. You know, yeah, I think you have to kind of play the long game and be smart about it. But some managers will just be cold and they'll be hard about it. And even like John Kiley, um, he has some amount of riches and some amount of, you know, very good players to look at, to look after. Um, I'd say, I'd say he's kind of, I'd say he's relatively cold about it as well, because you can't kind of have to be, you can't really waste too much time and doing it. Like you just have to pick your panel for a season and kind of move on. But I'm sure they wouldn't try and put any noses out of joint. Yeah. Okay. So much to come on, on the show today. I want to talk about, uh, you know, we saw a bit of it over the weekend. High Bob and dropped into the square in Gaelic football and, you know, Dermot O'Connor bundled one in against Monaghan. We saw Stephen Cohn knock one in against uh, Dublin. Just wondering, is that going to become more and more of a tactic now? But uh, that's one thing we want to talk about. We're going to deep dive into the different teams in the Hurling League, look at the top scorers per team. We're also going to have Keane Johnson on, former, well, and potentially future Offaly footballer on, to talk about the top five footballers in uh, in the country just now. So we've loads and loads to come. The comments are already flying in. Top five, uh, according to Jack, is hard to pick. Clifford was probably um, McGuigan, McCarthy, Sean O'Shea also. So a few other people commented on that. Uh, Stockroom Tim says, lads, what the hell are Cork doing playing Kingston, Horgan and Mead in the league? Where's all the under 20s? Adrian McGrath responds saying, if Cork picked a bunch of under 20s, they would get hammered. That's a good under 20 side. It wasn't extraordinary players jumping off the page announcing themselves as generational. The only player on that Cork team, the under-20 team, that beat your Offaly team in the final last year, that's senior this year, outside of the age bracket of under-20, is Ben Cunningham, who wasn't in the 26 over the weekend. We can only assume it's injury or being minded for maybe, you know, college competition or whatever. But uh, you, you would imagine him, that he would be playing uh, very, very soon. But it is a case that all these managers are juggling at the moment. The amount of games going on the college... They're, they're praying that the college teams get knocked out as soon as possible, the ones that have the, the most players. They are, aren't they? Ah, I don't Come know. On. I, they I don't, don't care how the, who wins college. They're just like, I need my players back now so I can work with them. Right or wrong, that's what they're thinking. Because all these competitions pit managers against each other. They don't want to wish ill on teams, but they kind of have to because they're like, we need our players right now. I don't know. I think if you see, I think if you see the bigger picture, you'd see the benefits of winning a Fitzgibbon, and even to a lesser extent, winning, what winning, talking, winning, winning, winning a Ryan picture? Cup. The Everyone bigger picture is is the month or two ahead of them. Go away nah, with your bigger picture. Not, not, not at all. The bigger picture is the championship. It's not the next month. It's the championship. And if a guy, 
Aaron Galan mightn't be playing with Limerick if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for the Fitzgibbon Cup. Um, in football, for some teams, the league is their championship. Yeah, I, I was I was more I was more kind of basing it basing it on hurling really. Do are managers wishing their wishing their players to be knocked out with championships? I don't think so. That might be your approach as a as a manager with some players you have involved in um in third level competitions at the moment. But I don't think you speak for the majority. I, I look. I think you're being a bit naive. But you, you basically, you basically said there that uh, any players that you're involved with at the minute that are playing at club level, that are playing third level, that you want them back now. Oh, of course, no. But you do, like, you do want them straight away. Like, you, you may not necessarily like. For me, there's no massive competition going on at the moment. So you know, you're kind, of, you, you've no problem with it, really. Well, I mean, you would love to have them. But what I'm saying is, like, the point actually remains for this as well. You would like to be working with your players right now and get as much kind of drilling things for the year or whatever, get patterns, whatever it might be. You want them now rather than like playing matches for another team. It just makes sense. So I would imagine it's like through the roof pressure with a county manager who's got like the eyes of the country looking at them or very least the county. He wants to have his players now because like if he has a bad league, the pressure's on for the championship. And I'm just saying it's just pitting managers of college teams against managers of county teams. The only thing is, I will say, is like some certain players can absolutely soar in the Fitzgibbon, a la like Mark Rogers last year, and bring a new, a new kind of found confidence to county level that maybe they wouldn't have had before. Um, so I, I do think, and even, yeah, I think Roger, like Rogers is juggling the two of them again this year and is absolutely flying. Mark Fitzgerald is another who's juggling the two, and there's plenty more, TJ Brennan, Mikey Kiley, and a few more. I think Kiley is still in UL anyway. Maybe he's not. But um. You can bring, yeah, Garota Connor, and obviously he's, you know, I saw I saw a headline the other day saying that Garota Connor staked his claim at the weekend, which I thought was kind of interesting because he was a starter last year. He's, you know a, he's I mean? a guaranteed starter for Tip this yeah, year. Yeah, so I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, but that I, that was a head that was a headline somewhere the other day. But uh, I do think it's a, a good a chance for lads to bring. Uh, a bit of a swagger and a confidence even to their county setup. But I, I do get your point. Managers, it's a shorter season than it's ever been before. And managers do want their hands on their players uh, as much as possible. Do they wish ill on their teams? I don't think they do, to be honest with you. Mm, I, I mean, that's a slight dramatisation. I just do think that a lot of them would, would be like, life would be easier now if that team got knocked out at the weekend. Let's call a spade a spade. Come on. Like, are you not telling me that Okay, I'll give you an example, a perfect one. So Tipperary have a good few players involved there with the likes of TUS Midwest, and they got annihilated by UL. So chances are they may, like UL are probably going to win the competition or be in the final, and the likes of TUS isn't going to beat them. But there's a few tip lads are uh, involved. Do you not know, think Liam Cahill, and look, I'm obviously putting words in mouths here. Do you not know, think he'd be like, well, look, it'd be handy if they got knocked out quick. They're not going to win the thing anyway, and I'd like to have them all the time here. I'd be looking at it differently. Um, I'd be looking at it as in they're not one of the stronger teams in the competition. But if they play UL and one of my lads from Tip survives for TUS Midwest against a class team, I'm like, okay, he doesn't need to play every league game for me. But I know that he will he will swim when lads are sinking around him. So I'd, I'd look at it differently, being honest with you. Okay, so you're looking at the edge case and deciding that that's the exception is the rule, basically. What the, well, Explain the edge case to me. So an edge case is an exception. It's the exception here. So like that's that's a, a big exception. But you could have lads in and be working with them and not have them being dragged away for meetings and ball work sessions with the, the college. And instead, like, for example, this week, there'd be teams playing for colleges, whether it's Sigerson or Fitzgibbon, and they wouldn't have been able to have their players probably on Monday because it was a bank holiday. So it'd be hard to assemble everyone together. So then instead, they would probably have them last night and they'll have them today for some matches or whatever. You know, all of that's not ideal if you're in the middle of a league run with your county. Oh, no, it's not ideal, but it's never it's never ideal as inter-county manager. Lads are going to be missing, lads are going to be injured, lads, lads are going to be, you're going to be without, you know, various players on various days. Adapt oh, and handy overcome. If they got knocked out. Ad, adapt, and, adapt and overcome. It, it's a good education for when it's probably going to happen for a championship game at some stage later on in the year. In a big case, and you're going to have to go deep into your squad and know that lads are going to be able to do a job for you. Uh, Talloman GA says, tip brand of Hurling is dire to watch. It's lo- it's like he's looking to get me going straight away. Well played, Talloman. You have, you have me on the run. Uh, to, just, just on that, like Liam Cattle has said, there's been a bit of turbulence with your style of play. Do you think it, like it's still a work in motion, obviously, is it? Um, yeah, 
but I thought there were signs of it working quite well against Dublin over the weekend because um, something that, that stood out to me was that, I mean, obviously Jake Morris got the headlines because he scored 1-4 and, and the goal was really good. But Tipperary put up a very good scoreline. Um, it was 227, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, it was. And you couldn't, it wasn't one of these cases where somebody kind of stepped up and, you know, scored massively and led the charge completely. It was one of those things where it was like 227 and everyone played pretty well. So that to me shows that, like, obviously you have good players, but they're playing within a style that suits everyone and doesn't rely on players who produce moments. So that's why I think it's a good sign. That to me tells me that what they're working on is, wor- you know, it's being somewhat successful and Tipperary don't just need to rely on somebody just pulling a, um, a rabbit out of the hat. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, that's a good sign if, if things, if, you know, they're humming as a team. That's kind of what you want rather than, as you say, isolated pieces of brilliance. You might need an isolated piece of brilliance at some stage in a championship game to, you know, pull their team out of the bag or whatever, but you want, you want, you know, Generally, you want the whole squad playing well, most of the team playing well. Sounds like even, I know Jake Morris took the headlines and even Gerard O'Connor took the headlines, but it sounded like their defence was pretty on top the other day as well. So, yeah, tip her back. <laughs> um, let's see. Once, Oh, yeah, he's saying that five hand passes once one would do. Whereas I would look at it that Tipperary were coming out from the back and there'd be a little hand pass and there'd be a second hand pass, someone coming off the shoulder, and then all of a sudden the player in possession was running towards their own 65 or out of their own half with the ball, with Everton in front of them and playing nice ball up the field. So you can say, like, to me, you're overdoing it when there's no point to the amount of extra passes you're doing in your own half or whatever half of the pitch it is. But what they're doing is working the ball around until somebody is coming off the shoulder and running directly upfield with their entire unobstructed field of vision before they can then do something. And that's the whole point of what they're doing. That's the whole point of what Limerick have been doing and dominating with for the last five years. It's what soccer teams do. They play the ball around until somebody gets it and they can see everything in front. Of them. It's pretty simple stuff. So you can say five hand passes when one will do, but that's the whole point. One won't do. Uh, the thing about a pass as well is why do you pass the ball? You pass the ball to give the ball to somebody that's in a better position or somebody who has a better chance of creating a move than you. Um, sometimes that's not one pass now. Sometimes that's two passes to get that third kind of killer pass to get the to get them kind of moving forward or whatever. But it's, it's definitely it's definitely changed a good bit. I put to that. Now the thing about Limerick is Limerick do that so fast and so swift, and it's like there's no hesitation whatsoever. Whereas the chasing pack, there is a bit of hesitation with it, and there's a bit of getting used to it as well. Um, like I said, I, I was I was reading something there earlier just about like like if Limerick are to be beaten, is it going to be something completely different? Something that we haven't seen? Is it? Go- it's not going to be Limerick Mark Two that beats them realistically, is it? No, because nobody's going to be able to do it better than they are. You, I mean, you basically like if some of your system is similar to what they're doing, fair enough. Like there's only, you can only play hurling so many ways, so there are going to be similarities. If you play the ball a bit short and a bit long, it's going to be kind of Limerick. But teams have been doing that for, you know, for years. So, you know, you just have to find a way to get your best players into the game as often as possible. And if possible, isolate them one-on-one as often as possible, surely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, well, that, that's it. And the, the thing about Limerick, defensively in particular, is just how there's never, like, outside of that picture we saw against Waterford last year where they were totally dragged away. You generally have lads always holding their positions. And they're able to hold their positions... Uh, like five, six, seven, two, three, four, because what eight to fifteen are doing up the pitch, um, and it's just a matter. Maybe it's a matter of upsetting, upsetting them up the pitch a bit more, and trying to maybe force lads to come out. But it is going to be interesting to see if anybody can unsettle them and throw something a bit different at them this year. Yeah, um, Limerick have already been, have already been beaten. Verney says Adrian McGrath. Is he suggesting that I'm saying Tip are very back? Talavan Gier says puke hurling. Now I'm wondering. Are you saying that a lot of teams, okay, obviously you're saying Tipperary, but are a lot of teams guilty of what you're considering to be Pew Curlin at the moment, Talaman? And are you including Limerick in that? So I'd be curious. I, we would have said over the last three or four years, Vernie, that most of the best games involved Limerick. So you and I have certainly never said they've got a bad style of hurling. No, because like it's it's bad when it breaks down and it's ponderous and slow, but it rarely breaks down with them. And it's always fast. It's always accurate, uh, highly skilled as well. So like I think if you look back at the 
all the best games since 2018, very, very few of them have not involved Limerick, realistically. I'd say Cork and Clare maybe last year. Um, Galway and Clare in, in 18, both games. But generally, it's been Limerick. And it's when someone has really put it up to them, we've got some absolute classics last year included. Yeah. By, by the way, if you want to get the audio podcast of this after the show, it's patreon.com forward slash our game. Also, if you're looking for a club fundraiser, email events at our game.ie. And also we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game to get 15% off. Teleman says, I'm saying in general, it's a rotten watch, constant hand passes. Uh, I just don't think that there's any way to get away from it. Teams are just going to do more and more of this. So, you know, yeah, the, the only thing I'd say about it, it's, it's, it's hand passing out around the middle generally but there's always you know it's always a stick pass in and it's always like it's not as if they're hand passing the ball over the bar or hand passing the ball into the net like it's hand passing to a point and then mm. it's hand passing to get to the point where you're able to strike a lovely ball into a good position I thought Wexford did that well the other day against Kilkenny as well um, and they were really trying to give you know a good ball inside and they were you know you could say they were um, hand passing in triangles and it was hand passing but it was out around the middle of the pitch it was to get themselves into the position, position to give a good strike inside and they always did you know generally did give a good strike inside but like it's bits of hand passing here and there but it's not it's definitely not all over the pitch or anything like that yeah and um, Conor Heaney says Talaman you're talking tripe in fairness tip fed the inside inside line a good bit tip actually did and you know we'll come to the game a bit more in a while but just while I think of it Tip did feed the ball inside to Andrew Orman, Jake Morris and Sean Ryan. Often they fed it to the corners where, you know, obviously it's a bit easier to get it to the corners because there's generally going to be someone sitting back. But they fed it to the corners where the boys fed it back out to the half back line or half forward line or whatever. So they recycled it quite well. Another thing is, and, and Pat Ryan made some comments about this, Tipperary were also scoring from distance. And we're seeing that across the board, like even in the in the club final as well, where we've seen the half back line from all Auckland Gales, as they had done in previous games. Scoring from distance, you know, is a big thing, but you have to make sure that they're good shooters from distance because, you know, we're going to be looking at shot maps and stuff like that. That's that's all so important. Oh, massively important. And the thing about Limerick shooting from distance is that it's generally the lads they want to shoot from distance. It's the they get they get there with Burns in a position where he can open his shoulders. Darrell Donovan's a good shooter from long distance, but they get him into a position where he can take a shot on the front foot. They're not. We, we look at a few shot maps here, and it's it's not necessarily over the shoulder stuff from the sideline, but it's real, real low percentage stuff from maybe players that shouldn't be taking shots as well at times. Yeah. Okay. So Talaman just adds, I was at their Munster League game too. Watch the league game on TV. Don't like watching Tip this year. Um, overdoing it. Uh, ML eighty nine says, if Limerick are to be beaten, it's going to be in Croke Park. Go up a gear with better conditions and speed of pitch. The beatings they've given Cork, Watford, and even Galway to Kenny last year. Okay, do you know what I'm going to do? We just looked at all the the top scorers for each team in the opening round of the league. Now, this may or may, may not matter all that much as things go along, but let's just look at it. Uh, for Clare, Mark Rogers, he scored 13 points. Gerard O'Connor scored 12. And obviously, you can see here on the images that plenty of it is from place balls. Keno Sullivan of Dublin with 11. Evan Nyland, the same for Galway. Stephen Bennett, 2-4 for Waterford, 1-7 for Patrick Horgan, Limerick's Adam English, 10, Billy Drennan, 2-3 uh, for Kilkenny, David Williams, Westmead with 7, Owen Cahill, 6 for Offaly, Seamus Casey, 1-2 for Wexford, and Conal Cunning, 4 points for Antrim. What sticks out to you there? Now, we chatted about this a little bit beforehand, but you know, there's a couple of things here that would kind of, number one, seeing, let's say, for example, Patrick Horgan being top scorer from Cork. He's on the road since, I think, 2008 what does it say about Cork that brilliant and all as he still is that you know he's still their number one guy like he will still play we know that and he still merits playing but he started and Conor Lahan who'll be 32 in the summer still started the other day you'd be thinking Cork would be would be kind of saying okay let's put a few young guys here we know that Lahan, what Lahan and Horgan will offer in the summer but we need to be putting in guys now who can you know stake a claim surely you know that scene in Wayne's World where the program is bought and like, you're my guys, my guys. It's like yeah. Horgan, is, Horgan is still the, the main man. It's mad to think like, what what are you actually learning outside? Like, you know what you're going to get from him. Um, should there not be some sort of a succession plan or something in place? Who's going to take the freeze? Maybe it's Ben Cunningham who's going to take the freeze for Cork over the next decade or whatever. But you'd imagine you'd be trying somebody um, in the league with the view to 
okay, if Horgan is off in a game or we know what he's going to give us when he's on the pitch. So maybe we should be looking at something different for next year and potentially for the end of a game if he's not on the pitch. I think something that, that, that definitely shows is like Mark Rogers picked up the freeze halfway during the championship last year. I think from Brian Lowen's point of view, it's, I, it's, it's nearly not necessarily a bad thing in a way that Tony Kelly is missing the league because Rogers has to hit the freeze and he's going to, play, he's going to hit the freeze in every league game He's obviously, Ed McCarthy started the other day and didn't hit any freeze. So they've obviously made a decision that Mark Rogers is going to be the free taker uh, for this year. So he obviously missed one or two maybe in the All-Ireland semi-final. This will give him a perfect chance to get a hell of a lot of practice against good opponents, different types of days, lots of pressure to be pressured, to be, to be freeze to win games, to be freeze to level games, to be freeze that they need to stay in games. It's per, it's perfect. It's you know he's potentially Claire's free taker over the next decade. So like that's polar opposites to Patrick Horgan and Cork. Do you know what I mean? That looks like okay, this lad is going to be the, the future. Whereas Patrick Horgan has been hitting freeze since since Ben O'Connor retired for Cork. Realistically, he's been hitting them probably the guts of about fifteen years nearly. Um, what are Cork really learning from? I know he want he wants to be on the pitch, but mm. what are Cork really learning from him being on the on the pitch and hitting all these frees and that they know generally what they're going to get out of him? But but maybe it's a case and Pat kind of alluded to this the day that Munster League game was called off. He said like we're not going to be really giving too many lads chances in games. Lads got their chances last year. We're going to pick the fifteen or the twenty six based on what's going on in training. So that would suggest to me that they're going to pick close enough to championship team when lads are available and in order to you're not going to be given a chance to get your get a jersey unless you earn it in training or you earn it in the 15 or 20 minutes you get in the game but um whether that's whether that's right or wrong it'll probably be proved right or wrong again come summertime it would suggest and this is in isolation one game there's lads missing all that kind of stuff that there isn't much putting their hands up now sean toomey came in and seemed to do a couple of okay things but like you look at the clear side no Tony Kelly, no Shane O'Donnell, no John Conlon. There's probably somebody else I'm not thinking of also. And they looked, you know, relative terms, like they control a lot of the game. Fair enough to give up a couple of goals and whatever, and they won't be delighted with that. But they kind of, you know, did very well without some of three of their probably main players. Yeah, uh, that's, a gr- that's a great sign for Claire. I thought, you know, I didn't see the full game, but the bits I saw of it when they got really down and dirty, I thought Claire were the more powerful kind of force, the more physical force. I thought the game suited them, particularly in the second half. I thought they made it a real dogfight. Um, did Cork go 14 minutes scoreless, I think, at the start, yeah, they the start went, of the second yeah, they went half? Something like seven behind, and then I was like, oh, they're getting beaten out of the gate. This is like watching Cork last year and the year before and the year before. And to be fair, then, they went and hit four or five in a row, and I was like, okay, we're going to see something a bit more about them. Yeah, I, I just, I don't know. Um, I don't think we really saw anything different in Cork the other day, um, and I thought, ah, listen, they could they could still get through to the knockout stages of the league, but you're just kind of thinking it's all it's the same personnel as well. Like you know, mm. you could you could it's a it's a movable feast. Um, like it, who was it? You know, Luke Mead. You no, know, Robbie Cotter is rel- relatively new. Connor Callan. It's the same kind of names over and over again. So that obviously shows maybe it's a bit like Tip a couple of years ago, where you may have been slightly bemoaning the fact that certain lads weren't getting maybe a chance, but maybe they weren't putting their hands up to get a chance. That's what, what I gathered from what was going on in training. They were picking the, the elder statesmen because they were still the ones that were doing it. So maybe it's the same case with Cork and maybe we're not going to see as many new faces this year as we would have expected to see. Yeah, I suppose Shane Barrett came in, had a bit of an impact. You've got like Michal Bullens is a player that we both think can, can step up. You are seeing the likes of Owen Roach out there own carry so there are new players and tommy o'connell does look like you know the bigger test will come for him down the line i was t- i was uh posting this on x on sunday about like you know it's it's he's clearly got the hurling the middleton man like we, we've seen him last year so he's a really good hurler is he going to be able for you know if he's playing wing back and he's against tom morrissey or Groot hegarty which is always the measuring stick you know how's he going to do in those situations no i'm not saying he can't he he, he possibly can but this is what we're going to need to see from Cork. And it's one thing, you know, I was going to say bullying an, an awfully underage team last year. But the players who are going to come through now, they're going to be smaller than than whoever they come up against against Limerick. Are they going to be able for it there? And how long will that take? There you go. Yeah. Um, and like it's I know John Kiley was bemoaning the fact that 
Um, he went back to the fact that it wasn't under 21 anymore and he just felt development-wise it's very, very difficult for lads to come out of under 20 and swim at, at senior inter-county level and that's going to be the same at Cork. Like, they're going to get a fair few rude awakenings and uh, that that could be why that they might go back to the same faces that they've, we've seen for the last good while and, like, will anything be different if that's the case? I, I would suggest probably not. Mm. Um, Crackety Ash says... There isn't a Limerick man that was at the Cork match last year that will doubt Cork from now on. They were excellent. And this was their first competitive game for almost seven months, you know, which was that Limerick game last year, and they weren't all that far away. And look, nobody's kind of said Cork aren't that far away more than I have over the last couple of years. I do think they have the players, but I was disappointed by basically feeling like I was watching the exact same performance the other day. And look, I think they should be better than that. But, you know, John Collins says here, checks calendar. It's still February. Who knows what the plan is? I'd be having a conversation after three or four games, not now. But, like, sure, we might as well not talk about anything at all if that's the case. <laughs> like, what we saw the other day just wasn't brilliant. No, you can only, ju- you can only judge what you're seeing at, the, at this moment in time. There was a good quote from Davy Burke uh, going around the other day. I think it was to do with their conversion rate, Roscommon's conversion rate. Mm-hmm. And he basically said, we haven't worked on that. This, at this stage, like, they've been working on other things. So, you don't, you, you don't know um, exactly what... Cork's focus is at the minute but just at this moment in time are we seeing anything different than last year probably not will we okay. see will we see in a couple of months you'd, you'd imagine so and hopefully so mm, okay and just even to touch on this again so I think it's interesting that we're seeing Stephen Bennett being the top scorer two two three two four sorry I should say against Offaly two one of that from play and you know, we thought he was heading for the morgue there the way, when we, the way we've been told about his hip issues the other day. Now, I've no doubt that he certainly is carrying an issue. But for him to be back in the team and scoring 2-4 after hearing such a bleak outlook on his injury situation, it seems a bit odd. Yeah, it's uh, obviously made fairly rapid progress because I'd say that was less than a month ago, maybe, where where, where Davy kind of said that. But obviously, uh, it's great to see him back on the pitch. One of those goals, One of those goals from play was actually... A botch free. I don't know if you saw it. He actually missed missed the pickup. Yeah, it's a twenty one yard free, and like that's criminal from an awfully point of view. That there's not enough men back. Like there should be three or four. I know this is the thing as well now, and it's something that the teams maybe will potentially capitalize on. That when someone has a free under twenty one, it's kind of taken now that even at an angle that they're just going to pop the ball over the bar, and there's only maybe one lad back with the keeper or something like that. So maybe teams will start thinking. That, that's maybe what you should be trying to explain. I remember chatting Shane Dooley about it before, and uh, he'd, he, I remember him saying to me that, uh, I think I mentioned on the show before, that if he was going, for, there, was 20, there was 21 and there was three lads on the line, that he'd made, and he knew he was going for a point, he'd make it look like he was going for a goal, just shift his, his run up a small bit and blast it over the bar. And then the next time, he'd make it look like he was going for, and they'd all be like, herds up, ready to go. Then the next time, he'd have real relaxed kind of body stance and he'd actually go for the goal and they wouldn't be ready for it. So maybe it's something that teams will go for now. They'll realise that teams aren't, the, the defending team aren't putting that many bodies back. But it was good to see, good to see Bennett back. Um, Billy Renan is another one. He came on and got, got two, three. Um, they were obviously all placed balls. He set up the penalty. Um, I think it was Billy Ryan, Billy Ryan that was pulled down. He slotted away the two penalties in the exact same position, which is kind of unusual to see. It kind of, he nearly he double he double bluff Mark Fanning in the goals because he kind of think he's if he went that side for the first one he'd hardly go that side again but he went that side again the the big question with Billy Drennan is is he going to offer you enough from play so Kilkenny cannot carry a free taker or if they are going to carry a free taker he's going to be one of the best hurlers of all time so they can carry him in T J Reid they cannot carry somebody else who will not offer you a lot from play and just. You know, anecdotally talking to people on the ground and looking at the Kilkenny under twenty one champion as well, just saying that Drennan does not stand out physically even at that level. And if he doesn't stand out physically at that level, he's go- he will find it tough at senior inter county level. So I'd be following his progress closely, but I don't think it's a formality that he's going to be a Kilkenny starter this year. Uh, far from it, being honest with you. Um, and a lot of the time you're saying a fella needs to bulk up or he needs to get physically stronger. Like that, not been smart to you. That time of the year is gone. Like you, your chance to your chance to make the gains are gone at this stage. Like you're going to be doing your own bits in the background, but your chance to make the gains was you know August, September, October, November, December, January. Maybe your chance to make gains physically now 
that window is nearly closed and you're just maintaining what you have at this stage. So mm. there would be that would be, you know, a small bit of a worry about whether he's going to start or not. Yeah, and you know, from his point of view, like he can hurl, he's certainly a very good hurler, oh, yeah. but like he's gonna have to deal with like that's the sort of thing he's gonna have, you know, coming in his ear now. So he's gonna have to deal with that and kick on, and maybe it'll just put a bit more of a fire in his belly. It's it's funny, Shane, oh, there's a I won't name names then, but there was a you know, a fella kicking football with awfully played football with awfully for the guts of a decade. Lovely player, but very, very light. And I mean this in the best sense of sense of, of the word, but his teammates in in a in a good kind of way that only lads can do, essentially bullied him into putting on about seven or eight kilos in a good type of way, if you get me. And like just saying, ah, you're being brushed aside or, you know, a, a stiff breeze would blow you away or this kind of thing. And over the next couple of years, you know, he came back and was well able to look after himself at county level. And may, maybe Billy Drennan, I'm not saying that he needs to hear it, but you'd love to see him. He's not a particularly big guy, so he's going to have to be able to look after himself. And even like when, when they played Limerick in the league final last year, he's kind of thinking, okay, he's on Sean Finn here. It's going to be a great test. And like, that was, you know, there was only one man in it, really. And I know Kilkenny were struggling that day, but I thought physically and everything, I thought Finn kind of bossed him. So it's definitely something Billy's going to have to go after over a couple of years. There's no doubt in his hurling ability whatsoever. Yeah, Trump Spieler says, very harsh on Drennan. Look good to me in 2021, under 20 final versus Limerick and all through last year's league. So look, we're not writing anybody I don't off. think it's been harsh. I just think it's been realistic that if he's going to make a big impact at county level, he's going to have to transform himself a small bit. Um, can I ask you then about the red card for Offaly against Waterford? So 17 points to 320 finished for Waterford. And to me, it was like, we've had this discussion over the years where I keep saying to you, what is it about Offaly, Leash, Carlo, you know, teams that are, you know, somewhat bridging that gap between like being right up there with the elite teams and just a little bit step below getting silly red cards. What is it? Time and time again, we see it. And again, I was like, Lewis Hurley from Leon Fox gets the road. And any chance that really awfully have of winning that game goes up in smoke. What is it? Too ignorant. <laughs> no, like this was a bit of a throwback to, to awfully a couple of years ago when there was a lot of loose pulls, finished, they might have finished against Wexford with def definitely with 13 anyway in a Leinster game a couple of years ago. Um, and it just like awfully were after getting themselves back into the game the other day. The ball kind of popped and, and Fox pulled 20 years ago, it would have been fine. Now you, you just can't do it. It's just so loose um, and the referee is going to pull it straight away and you're not really giving him, you're not really giving him a choice. Like he, he full, he pulled full blooded, like as in a full swing. If you come in with a flick, it's a little bit different, but he full, he pulled it in a way that even if he connects with the ball, he's in trouble, isn't he? Unless he connects with the ball, absolutely flush. He's, and even if he did, he probably still would be under pressure because it would be seen as dangerous play because he would have just followed through and nearly decapitated the Waterford man. So just really loose. And it, um, it, it killed probably any chance that we had of getting something out of that game because we had kind of clawed ourselves back into it okay because it, it was looking, wasn't looking great at half time, And we gotten it back to, you know, a two-score game and that kind of, I think Waterford hit seven or eight in a row thereafter and that was it. Yeah, it's kind of funny that, you know, last year we were looking at Watford getting a lot of red cards at this time of the year. And, you know, like Tipperary got a red card against uh, Watford in the Munster Hurling League for Robert Byrne and a bit of a loose pull, which wasn't that dissimilar, actually, to what Leon Fox did the other day. And number one, the manager then looks at you a little bit differently if they're like, geez, what's the point in, you know, doing a loose pull there? So Leon is going to have to be a little bit smarter the next day. And, you know, you, it just really does hand the, op uh, the impetus to the opposition. Um, there was something else I wanted to ask you about, but no, if you want to take up a point there, go ahead. No, Jack just says about Drennan, he says, Drennan is young, he can still improve, harsh writing a player off. Jesus, if, that, if that's writing a player, if that's writing a player off. The thing about, this, this is the big thing as well, Billy Drennan has the skill, um, and we saw that in the under-20 final. A lot of players don't have the skill, and you can't learn that. It's much easier to go and, you know, anybody can go to the gym and develop and get to that level if they want to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So he has the, the raw materials. I think it's just a matter of, Jesus, we, we are far from, from written him off. If anything, we've just said physically he needs to get to this level. And that's, as I said, that's something you can go after. Um, it's it's more, probably more of an individual thing. I think he's really going to have to go after. But if he does over the next couple of years, he could be a serious weapon for Kilkenny. Cuckoo asked, were many of last year's awfully 20s involved in the Waterford game? 
Uh, Sam Burke started and Dan Burke started. Uh, Adam Screeny was on the bench. So very, very few. And it's going to have to be... Uh, Cottle King might have started as well, I think. Um, it's, you know, it's going to be a real balancing act this year between trying to blood some of them at, some of them at senior level, but also making sure... To, like To me, I, I know it's a lesser grade, but I think it's of it's imperative that Offaly give the under-20 a right go crack this year with a full complement, if at all, if at all possible. Um, mm. And I think those lads, when push comes to shove, that should be the priority um, at that time of the year to try and potentially get back to a, an under-20 Leinster final if they can at all. Mm, okay. Well, look, I want to go back and talk a little bit more about Cork. So as we said, Clare 125, Cork 219. And I was looking at where Robbie O'Flynn was playing, and it's mostly close to goal now. And you know yourself, you're playing in the full forward line. Often you're getting the ball with your back to goal. And I just wonder, to, like, and he's still good and he's effective and he played a nice cross-field ball uh, for Tommy O'Connell to get in for his goal and he scored a point or two himself. Really good player. Like, he's he's up there, could be, like, in a real conversation for the top 10 in, in the hurling, you know, if we're looking at the power rankings of best players. I'm not saying he's there at the minute, but he's one of those guys with the raw materials to do it. But, like, if you're Cork, do you not want him coming on to ball and charging up through the middle of the pitch rather than having his back to go a collecting ball in the first place. Yeah, I see, th the thing is here, I think Robbie O'Flynn is very fast, but I think he's, like, it's a different type of pace on an inside line. It's real instant. Do you know what I mean? It's five or ten yards. Robbie O'Flynn is unstoppable if he has a head of steam. So if he's mm. coming on to a ball out in the middle of the field, I think he's nigh on unstoppable out there. I think... Maybe it's something they're trying him in, in the inside line. Maybe it's with a view to... We were doing it last year as well, though. Yeah, but I, I think I think he's a really dangerous half-forward for them. It could, potentially at centre-forward as well. Um, but it's it's obviously something that they're looking at and something that they, they think they can make hay off. I, I think he's a far more effective coming from deep line positions because he has that. He has speed, but it's maybe not that instant speed. Once he gets going, I don't think very, very few wing backs are going to stick with him. Mm. Another thing I noticed was Conor Lahan was playing really deep, and uh, especially in the first half. Like obviously, he can come through and score a point. Like we've seen that before, but and he also has to be marked. You can't just allow him to run the length of the pitch and have him dominate. And if if he can get on a load of ball, but I thought he was good at knit and play a bit further out the field, and probably means you know, less pot shots from the sideline as well. Like, I, I think he's really good, but I think sometimes he, he shoots when he shouldn't. And if you're that bit further out the pitch, he's probably going to have the head up and be picking out passes rather than, you know, always taking on scores. But, you know, it isn't fair, on him, you know, to be relying solely on him to do scoring either. Not that they necessarily are, but it may, maybe it's just a slightly new role for him. Yeah, the, the only thing about Lahan that my worry would be is, I don't know, in the cut and trust of a championship game, there's, there's not as much loose ball in that middle third. There's no loose ball in that middle third, really. Like, do you know what I mean? It's it's hard. It's hard one. I don't know if that best suits kind of his best attributes. Been been honest with you, but they are trying lads in different positions. Um, and just a couple of other a couple of other fellas. Sorry on on the question that was asked there, but awfully, Donald Shirley came on from uh for own cattle when he went off injured before half time. He's a, a a mad enough one. He's from Tubber and awfully fairly sure he's the first ever uh awfully senior herder to come from that club. That'd be Kieran McManus's club. That'd be far more predominantly um a football club. So a fair achievement for him as well. Yeah, and hurling well for DCU freshers at the moment. Then also I saw a stat from uh, Christy O'Connor talking about Cork giving up 115 from uh, turnovers. Dennis Hurley of the Cork Echo, he had a, a stat, um, another stat. He said Sunday's last clear was Cork's second defeat in the regular section of the league since the beginning of the 2022. So obviously that's not the knockout stages. He said last year the Rebels had four wins and a draw as they reached the semi-finals. The year before that, they were beaten by Wexford in their last match. But that was after qualification for the last four had already been achieved. So that'll tell you that, in general, they're doing quite good in the regulation rounds of the league. So we could see a, a total change from this weekend onwards. They're hosting uh, Kilkenny. But Pat Ryan was talking after the game. He was saying to the media, we did a lot of things right last year, but it still wasn't, uh, or it wasn't uh, enough to get us over the line, even though we put in some good performances. There are definitely areas that we'd like to tweak in the game plan in terms of shape and structure, having our puck outs down clear, all the things that give you a better chance of winning. We probably gave up an awful lot of opportunities to opposition half-backs last year when we looked back at it. That's something that you'd be trying to marry up a bit. 
it's one area where we're looking to go after cutting down the chances given to them. And obviously that comes back to the likes of Dermot Burns and, you know, who else will teams play in the half back line? We often talk about Claire, their half backs probably shooting too often. You see Connor Bowe going wing back with Tipperary. That's probably with a view to him attacking. Maybe Michael Breen will be there also. So it's an interesting one. And then also we were just looking at a piece, uh, that same piece that um, Dennis Hurley had done in the Echo. And he was looking at a bit of a shot map for um, for Cork in that game against Clare. And we thought it was quite interesting. You might take up the point here just for people. The green ones, they're, uh, they're goals. The white ones are points. If they've got the double circle, they're freeze. And everything beyond that, they're misses, the red and the blue. Yeah, no, I just thought that this is the um, this is the first half against the breeze. From a Clare point of view, you'd be happy enough with where their shots are coming from and the fact that they weren't slaloming down the middle of your defence. And it was kind of similar in the second half there. If you if you bring up the graph for the second half, mm. the scores were coming from, you know, there was some of the, some sh- a lot of shots taken from out the side, but there was no shot really taken anywhere in around the D or inside which is a very good sign of, like, Clare without John Conn and David McInerney was playing at playing at six, and he actually, it's funny, Cork played a stray ball. I think it was, was it Cormac Murphy played a stray ball down the, down the line, and uh, David, or David McInerney put it back over the bar with interest. But it's a good sign from the spine of the Clare defence that they weren't really coughing up anything easy. Then if you look at it from a Cork point of view, you know, there's three, you know, there's three reds taken out by the, you know, the stand sideline in Cusick Park, they're low, you know, they are low percentage shots. And you can say there's two points from the from the other side underneath the, the shed that, that went over the bar from the sideline. But they are, those three reds down the right-hand touchline are lower percentage shots, you'd have to say. And I, I don't think from, from speaking to Pat, or from speaking to Pat Ryan after the Clare game in the Munster League game, like he was trying to really push to them that, you know, their, their shot choice and where they were shooting from needed to be a hell of a lot better. And you've no problem with lads maybe not converting the chance as long as they were taking the chance from the right area. And some of the shots there, you wouldn't be 100% impressed with. You know what, in a game where you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, low percentage, low percentage. And if it goes over the bar, it's great. But it is, you know, there's too, probably too many low percentage shots there. Yeah, and generally a team will pay the price if they're shooting from distance over and over, especially if they're not settled when they're shooting. Remember Which, Jim McGuinness again when they beat Dublin in fourteen. He the tactic was actually let them shoot from outside the forty five. And if you know, and I'd say he was maybe half wondering when did Flynn put over four in the first half? I think and Dermot Conley might have put over two from outside the forty five, outside the right boot, and they were nearly out of the game. But generally, you know. You can't, they, that won't keep happening throughout the course of a game. If you if you're forcing a team to take lower percentage shots, eventually the averages will probably get on your side, and that's probably somewhat what happened with Clare the other day. I was just saying, Brian Lowen was made a very good point. He just said we kept the scoreboard ticking over when Cork maybe weren't able to at different stages, and that basically was the difference. That that spell at the start of the second half was the difference. Yeah, we will give Cork a bit of credit though because the goal, the the goal for um, Patrick Horgan came from Sean Toomey, and then um, who was the second person? Shane Kingston running through the centre and setting it up for Horgan with the nice little drop shot. And then actually, like when we're talking about Horgan, and you're talking about the positives that he obviously brings, and maybe this is why Pat Ryan needs him playing because he does the smart stuff like that finish. Like you saw Mark Rogers getting yeah. blocked down when he shouldn't be getting blocked down for one of the goals. Or sorry, for one of the goal chances. And then Horgan, so he had that cute finish with the drop shot, which is, you know, that's a rarity. Down oh, the drop shot. <laughs> but then also the, the sideline cut led to the other goal. So what he did was he shaped to hit the ball down the line. And obviously Claire will have a spare man because, you know, Horgan doesn't have to be marked. He's taking the sideline. So he shaped to play it down the line where Robbie O'Flynn was and committed the spare defender to that direction. Then uh, Robbie O'Flynn cut back the other way. He played the ball right into his path, and then a lovely stick pass over the top, over towards Tommy O'Connell for the finish. And uh, to be fair, when they did get through down the centre, that's when good things happened. But obviously, as the stats show there, they probably just didn't do it enough. And we have to talk about the ball from Davy Fitzgerald across for Shane Amori. Just a thing of beauty. Yeah, it was perfectly into his path. Like it couldn't couldn't have been any better. Uh, and it kind of looked like maybe he was going to be pulled down, but it was. A, um, then maybe the defender thought twice about it, and it was a brilliant finish for Mori, but just a beautiful pass across from Fitzgerald. Just back to your sideline thing as well. I don't know about you, but when I was on the pitch, I loved to see a fella 
lining up a line ball like he's going to hit 70 yards. Oh, gee, oh. Well, not Owen Connolly against Dublin. I wouldn't say yeah, that. Yeah, right. fair, fair, fair point. But, you know, when you're standing inside and you see a fella and he's just going for distance, like it just like when compared to when you see a fella and he's shaping and you don't know where he's going and your man is making a run and there's three or four dummy runs to create a run and then it's sometimes it's given back to the taker. To me, like that that creates a bit of consternation. And I don't know if I said it to you before, but Aaron Galan took on a line ball like in, you know, garbage time at the end of last year's All Ireland final and it went wide. But it was the first line ball that they had taken on for a score since the 2019 All Ireland semi final when Killian Buckley deflected one. Like, imagine to say that. And that's why they always try and play the percentage of can I, rather than, like, we have the ball, we don't have it in our hand, we have it at our feet. How can we hold on to the ball? And they've come up with some pretty creative ways of holding on to the ball, I'd say, in the last four years. And they've got a fair few kind of score chances from them as well. Yeah. And um, Conor Heaney says, thought on Hoggy's touch. Class. Outrageous. The one hand like were... that's. When you're coaching other players, unless they've proven time and time again that they can do this sort of stuff, you would tell lads, well, you just put your hand out and catch the ball. <laughs> Whereas with Horgan, you wouldn't dream of telling him what way he should take down a ball. There's a fella that hurts a bird there, Shawnee Ryan. I won't mind, mind me saying it, but he'd be, run, he'd be running out to a ball like that, one hand, and he's just like, Shawnee, not in the month of Sundays is the ball going to come into your hand. Will you just go down and get the, take the crutch and get it into your hand? Like he goes down and kind of stabs at it and hope that it's going to come up to him. Um, but I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, he probably will mind me saying it to be honest with you. But mm. Horgan, like that's what Horgan, what Horgan's touch is probably like something. Who else could do that? Owen Kelly. Who else could do it? Richie Hogan, maybe. Like there's very few people that would have the strength of wrist to be able to control a ball like that out full stretch. And take the touch on it very 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 few yeah let us know who you think would uh, would also be able to do it um so kilkenny and wexford uh any particular thoughts on that what it means for either team i mean you know yeah a, a small bit yeah to be honest with you like kilkenny just seemed to have an issue with wexford for the last good while to be honest with you i'd say i'd give him fair credit when since davy came in to wexford he eliminated the fear factor that wexford had for a long long time playing Kilkenny, be it home or away. Remember they went to Nolan Park in 14 and were absolutely filleted. Like, they were absolutely destroyed. Um, and ever since Davy came in, they beat them in a league game in 17, I think. And then they beat them down in Wexford Park in a championship. First championship win over them in a good while. They were beaten, I think, a point in Nolan Park in 18. They drew with them in 19 in Wexford Park, then beat them in the Leinster final. Uh, and then, like, Wexford saved their bacon against against uh, Kilkenny in 22. They saved their bacon even more so last year. I think it's a it's you know it's another little plus in the Wexford column. If Wexford were able to deliver what they deliver against Kilkenny against other teams, they'd be in around the All Ireland quarter final stages most years. It's just a matter of being able to bring whatever it is. Kilkenny, it just it just seems to suit them, and a lot of it is. Uh, and I know they didn't really do it the other day, but when Wexford have played with the sweeper or the plus one at the back. Kilkenny have generally not been able to work around it for whatever reason. Now, mm. Wexford didn't really play like that the other day. Well, definitely not as much, or it wasn't as obvious. But um, yeah, I'd say from a Wexford point of view, if you're able to put every team you're playing in black and amber jerseys, um, their results would improve tenfold. Yeah, Adrian McGrath isn't happy with us. He says, 20 minutes about this match, not a single mention of any new Clare players. Well, to be fair, I thought um, Robin Mouncey did quite good as well. He got himself a couple of points. Uh, Gro Chihi, he got a, a point also. Thought he did good. But like, I, I'd be happy enough to hear your thoughts on it. I think Darrell Owen is coming to the boy quite well as well. Uh, he looks like he's really filled out, like he's got a bit of speed about him. So, it, you know, I think he's quite good. Sean Rin also played in around the middle of the field. So let us know your thoughts on it. Uh, no doubt you've been keeping a close eye on them. I, I was looking at the Limerick and Antrim scoreline the other day. So this game wasn't on live anywhere and I wasn't at it. And at half time I saw, okay, it's not, you know, there's not too much between the teams. It's one seven to 16 points. So they're like six points. Okay, fair enough. Second half scoreline, 120 to two points. And you just look at then also what happened between Galway and Westmead, 431 to 12 points, 31 point beaten there. And you're like, geez, the change in the league structure probably can't come quick enough. It, it like very ha hard to know what Darren Gleeson and Joe Fortune can say to their players after that. Like that's really really tough. Those are the sort of teams that will fill it. A team that's not right there in the chasing peloton. 
Yeah, Galway just seem to be able to whatever is with S and whatever is is with teams that they should be, you know, winning convincingly against. They generally do. They put you to the sword, and they, you know, they could bang the guts of five thirty in a game like that. That just seems to be the way they are. They're very, very clinical in that regard. Say if Henry could get that kind of, you know, that same kind of edge against the better teams, he, he'd be fairly happy. But like Westmead going back into one B, you know, would probably be a lot more realistic next year. Probably same same with Antrim, Offaly, and even whoever comes up from two A as well, it would it would suit them a hell of a lot better. Um, but yeah, like do do they do they learn much? Like Darren Gleeson said they were competitive in the first fifteen or twenty minutes. You know, the first fifteen or twenty minutes is kind of nearly an outlier in most games. Like any, you know, it could be five points apiece after fifteen minutes, and then you could be you could be fifteen minutes later, you could be seven or eight adrift. So like I wouldn't really read too much into that, but. Does look like it's going to be a tough season for Antrim, um, particularly with the players that they're missing. It's going to be very hard to get away from that. And it and and Darren won't make any excuses, but in his fifth year, it's a bit of a tough one to take because you've put so much time into developing this squad or whatever, and you're going to be without, you know, six or seven of your best, and you know, two of them definitely ain't coming back. And the five lads, by all accounts, are, are stepped out for a year. Some talk that Keelan Malai might be back later on in the year. Um, but just being down that sort of personnel is really detrimental for them realistically. Yeah, you might ask me a bit about the Dublin Tipperary game. So Dublin twenty two points, Tipperary two twenty seven. But maybe you want to just ask the questions. Yeah, no, that line ball you talked about the other day was one of one of, was one of my big takeaways anyway, and just how quickly it was taken and how it was fairly off the cuff as well. But like who I saw Jake Morris got one four inside, look look very, very dangerous. I think giving him vice captain is a good move from Liam Cattle as well, who knows him very well. He stepped up last year and was one of their better players. He's vice and like you'd be hoping that he can lead the line. Rona Matter is obviously captain. But like what were the you know, what little bits of new information did we did we pick up that maybe we didn't know coming into the game? Because they, they did kind of it was kind of uh, it was the sort of performance that you'd want first round of the league going up to Dublin against Dublin. Yeah, well, like last week, weren't we talking about it? Traditionally, it's supposed to be seen as this big physical test. You go up to Dublin in the tight confines and all that kind of stuff. And I was saying to you that I didn't think that this Dublin team was built that way. So to me, it wasn't a surprise to see Tipperary win. You kind of knew after five minutes that you know the game was going to be more or less in the books because. Like Brian Hayes with a brilliant run inside the opening couple of seconds, he won the break for you know from the throw in, scored a nice point. Nobody was going to catch him, and after that, Tipperary scored six points in a row, and you just kind of felt like, where are Dublin going to get any oxygen here? And realistically, they didn't get any from anywhere. Now they are missing players. Like let, let's call a spade a spade. They're missing Owen O'Donnell. They're um, off the top of my head. They're also missing Danny Sutcliffe. There's a couple more as well that I'm not thinking about off the top of my head, but they certainly were down more than a few for this game. Uh, so that that's obviously always difficult when you're up against a Tipperary team that's pretty much humming. Now, again, you could look at Tipperary and say, where's the likes of Jason Ford? And there's one or two others, Michael Breen, that will come back into the team also. But Dublin do look like they have very few players that can probably hurt you at the moment. Now, the ball did stick inside a little bit more. Paul Crummy, I think, you know, I, I keep talking positively about him. Like he's he was quite good as well when he got ball. Dermot O'Dooling, he was also very very good. He was he was a big positive for Dublin in this game because when the ball went in, he did give Tipperary a bit of difficulty. But Ronan Hayes, he was uh, named number eleven, and he just didn't look like he was right to me. He was taken off during the first half. I don't know if he's been carrying a knock or something like that, but he he just didn't even look like he was moving like himself. There was one ball in particular where he went to, and I said to the person beside me, "That's." That just doesn't look right at all. And he was taken off not long after. But um, Tipperary, it's just options everywhere. Um, Rona Maher's playing full back again. And Robert Byrne, he was picked at centre back again. And to me, like, they're, you know the way you could pick a holding, hurling centre back like Declan Hannon? I think Tipperary have just said, we're just going to pick physicality, size. And all of these lads can hurl anyway. So it's it's just, it's a different type of player. Like, he's quite a combative type of player. Yes, he'll hold and whatever and do what's asked of him. But Tipperary are just going for combative players all over the place. Now, Dublin made a bit of a burst at the second at the start of the second half and got three points in a row and pulled it back from, you know, pulled it back from the brink a little bit, had it back to 11 points to 18, 12 points to 18. You know, they were pairing it back a little bit. It was one-way traffic in the first half. 
And then Tipperary, their final 12 shots of the game, sorry, their final 14 shots of the game, they scored 211. So it was like when a bit of a threat came, it, it was like they tuned in again. And like the end of the first half, they'd hit several wides and, you know, one or two shots that didn't go where they were meant to go. And then all of a sudden a threat came and the whole team collectively just said, we're out of here. And they just pushed on and they took the goals. Like Sean Ryan finished beautifully, bottom corner, no such thing as putting it towards the roof of the net or anywhere where, where the goalkeepers Hurley can get at it. Same with Jake Morris, beautiful stick pass over the top from Willie Connors. And it was just a case of like Dublin just couldn't live with it. What's this game like for you? Like, would you be getting much abuse about, you know, the fact that you're half Dublin now or? <laughs> no, no, like nobody within Dublin would ever think that I'd be cheering for anyone but Tipperary because I wouldn't. I like no one, no one within Dublin would want you as a dub. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like I want Dublin teams to do well. I've never made a secret of that. And I'd be looking at some of the guys on the Dublin panel that I might know from you know, whatever college teams or, you know, club teams and whatever. I want them to do well, but against Tipperary, there'll never be any doubt, like, Tipperary will always be the team I'll be cheering for. So, yeah. I, I was, you know, I was disappointed watching the Dublin team and watching their challenge being so so weak in this game. And, like, I see a comment here from Bryson Peters saying, put a man marker on Jake Morris and he won't touch a ball. He's not able to win his own ball. Just see what happened against Galway last year in the quarter final. Where, would you, where do you land on that comment? Um, I thought Tipperary made a mistake against Galway last year. He predominantly played out half forward. And when he went in, I'm mean, right in saying I think he went in for the last 15 or 20 minutes and he helped him get back into the game, I think. Um, it's it's kind of grand saying put a, ma put a man marker on him. But I still think he'll, on his day he'll do a fair, fair bit of damage. I think he's a much better player now than he was a couple of years ago. And I think he's much more of a physical force than he was a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that now. Yeah, okay. So, What's your um, opinion on it? No, I think he's... I, I, if Tipperary are playing well and there's a good balance to the side, which that's what they're moving towards, I think he's going to do damage on absolutely anybody. And I think he'll have a big season this year. And I think Tipperary will be quite good. Now, I'm not quite saying Tipperary are back, but I think Tipperary are improving. They're heading towards being back at some point. But Willie Connors, that's definitely a big boost from last year. Like, he, he wasn't around. He looked like he was in great form. He got himself a point. Owen Connolly been moved into midfield. I'm not saying it's the only position. Obviously, it's not the only position he can play. But it's no harm that he's playing there as well to add more physicality. Maybe he'll go back to the backs at some stage. Uh, Gerard O'Connor, when Tipperary were struggling at the start of the second half and three or four puckouts went out and they weren't being won, they start hitting them on him and he wins them or breaks them or does something with them. Andrew Ormond looks like he can be a good player this year. So Gerard O'Connor is a player that, to me, is only going to get better because if you look at the size of him, like he's, like, he's going to be doing all his gym work and whatever, but he will naturally fill out over the next couple of years as well. And to me, like, I'm not saying, I don't know if I'd have him in the machine category, but he's going to be... He is going to be a big physical weapon, um, and it's looking like it's going to be like that as well. It's just going to take him a bit of time to fill out into his frame, but he is getting there. Okay, well, look, we're going to bring Keen Johnson in here, awfully footballer over the last number of years. Keen, how's things? Well, boys, what's the well, you, you know each other well. Not from the football uh, team. Well, it's good, good to have two awfully boys uh, outnumbering a tip man here now, to be honest with you. But um, I almost got retired this morning by saying, what was that about? I'm only 24, will you relax? I didn't quite retire yet. I was just like, wait, now, are you on the panel this year or not? I know, are... ah, look, I'm with the club there. We, we lost the county final last year. So, um, yeah, look, looking at that, we played to a high enough standard there. So I'm exposed to that kind of training and back then a bit of soccer there as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Don't retire me too early, anyways. <laughs> I see, yeah. it, like, Jay's keen. Like, there's a fella gone back in with Down. I think he's 39. He's gone in as sub keeper. He hadn't played for Down in seven, seven or eight years or something like that. Uh, is it Kevin Anderson, I think, is his name. Like, Jesus, there's a, you've, a, you've another good decade in you, let alone this man retiring you. But that's, listen, the tip boys will take any sort of a cut they get. Any chance that arises, they'll take it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the intercounty retirement age is getting younger, I suppose. But the likes of Paulie Clifford or that maybe who kind of only came into his own when he was 25, 26. So, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Keen, what did you make of the football over the weekend? Like, I'll just go through some of the results and you might tell us then what stood out for you over the weekend. So, Mayo beating Dublin by a point there. Derry 
they saw off Tyrone convincingly enough for a finish. Ross Common drew with Galway and Kerry went up to Clonus and had a win by nine points. But like was there was there any team that stood out for you, even beyond the top division? Um yeah, so just the, probably the Monaghan Kerry game uh we'll start with because um I just think the Sean O'Shea moved full forward is really interesting because like at the start when he was kind of playing there, I thought I never really thought he they would go with it. I thought it was just something that they were maybe trialing until Clifford comes back. But he's just he looks so uh, comfortable there. He scored he scored seven five from play, three off the left, two off the right. Like so, I mean if if they're if they're able to afford to leave him in there with Clifford in like big games, saying semi finals and finals, I think it's gonna be very hard to stop because like most teams will play with a plus one. Um, so say Dublin or Derry or whoever in a semi final or final and that that plus one will normally go Clifford like so if you if you leave Sean O'Shea free the way the runs he was making yesterday kind of like Andy Moran used to do kind of east to west runs in front of the goal where he was getting two or three yards separation and then all you have to do is pop it over the bar like so like for a lad that hasn't played much football inside like he's so he's so smart and like even the last couple of years like I know like he's one of their main players but like the 2022 final like Liam Silk like almost took him out of the game he was he, he didn't score from play and he wasn't really in the game. And even last year, like John Small done a fairly good job in him. So like he can be tied down when he goes out the field. I know his kick passing is really good. Long range shooting is good, but I, I think that's something that we'll definitely see uh, going into the summer. Just on that, Keen, I suppose the big thing for Jack O'Connor is if O'Shea is taken from the half line, then that's you know that's to me like that's probably one of their weaker lines outside if, if uh, Paddy Clifford. Um, I was obviously a brilliant player. Stephen O'Brien played the All Ireland final last year. It was him coming in the semi final that probably tipped the balance. But a big thing that that Jack O'Connor is going to have to develop now is probably score and half forwards and more of them. Particularly if O'Shea is going to go inside, he's going to need something to supplement the half forward line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, Killian Burke started wing forwards um, on Sunday. And he's a big lad. He done well in the club championship. Um, he scored a goal. Um, He's very mobile. Look, look, I don't know. It's hard to read into sometimes, like the the players who get their chance in the league, because like even like the last couple of years, like Don O'Sullivan was flying it for Kerry. Dara Roach was in there, like Killian Spillane, Tony Rosden. Like they've all kind of um, got the run, and like, there's, there's spots there in the forward line, like outside of the two Cliffords and Sean O'Shea. Um, like there is spots there that just keep getting rotated around. So um, yeah, I don't really know who they're gonna who they're gonna go with. And even midfield as well, like with Jack Barry being gone, um, like Dermot O'Connor is obviously established now, but like Joe O'Connor back from the cruise ships, he had a very strong game yesterday. And uh, like that's going to be massive for Kerry as well, along with the half forward line, because like it's, it's Dublin and Derry probably who they're going up against for the All Ireland. And like you look at uh, Fenton and McCarthy and then Rogers and Glass, like it's, you know, like they're probably the two best midfield in the country. So like, I mean, uh, Joe O'Connor is really going to have to come into his own um, for Kerry, like. Uh, we were saying, Keane, um, in recent weeks, could Sean Kelly make a similar move for Galway, get out to midfield, or would they miss him at full back? Yeah, he probably could, because uh, he, he is good at making them bursts. Um, yeah, I think it was Johnny McGrath has been uh, in cornerback for Galway. You'd probably lose that bit of size in there if um, if teams w- went direct with a bigger player in there. But, yeah, I'm not sure what his story is. He's, he's, he, was, he was injured. Um, yeah. He featured much, but... Uh, yeah, that probably is something we could see. Um, just on the kind of Kerry Monaghan game as well, like just for, for Stephen O'Hanlon last week, like he was electric, but uh, Tom Sullivan followed him everywhere. Like the minute the ball was thrown up, he just went for him and he never left his side. And like Tom Sullivan scored two points and Stephen O'Hanlon scored one. So it was kind of like he got brought back down to earth a small bit. Um, you know, he was the man last week and this week, like I know, He's uh, he'll probably have to get used to that and he will learn from it, but it just kind of to me, it kind of just pointed out like how how exceptional it is that the likes of say Clifford and Shane McGuigan that every week they're man marked and they still come up with the goods. So, um, like he's going to be targeted now throughout the summer, like not saying uh, Dublin like didn't do their preparation for the first round of the league, but maybe they just kind of were sleepwalking into it. Like Kerry obviously got the video of last week and they did, uh. Thomas Sullivan just took him out, like so. Yeah, and then even McDonald in the goals for Monaghan, who had a great game last week as well. Like he had a tough day with kickouts, and even the last goal, like I know the game was done at that stage, but 
he didn't deal with the high ball and it went in the net. So, like, I mean, Monaghan really need Rory Beggan back. Like, he's gonna, they're going to have to hope he doesn't make uh, inroads in the NFL. But, um, yeah, that was that was it from that game, really. Yeah, just, I on, thought... just on Monaghan, um, it's funny, like, everything went nearly perfect the first day and it's probably the other day, it's everything didn't obviously didn't go perfect it's probably somewhere in between for some of those kind of newer players um they're not probably maybe as good as they were the first day they're not as bad as they were the second day but just something you mentioned there um and you were talking about sean kelly and even man mark you obviously play in the inside line per- predominantly what's it like when you have a player like that who's not only marking you but is like really really keen to put you on the back foot and bring you out to the middle of the field um, I know you you had a fam- you had a famous quote after one of the county finals where it was just give me the ball and I'll score. The rest of the boys can, can do the hard work. I think that's probably changed now, and I don't think your club manager Joe Rafferty would let you away with that. But what's it like when a defender tries to put you on the back foot like that? He's not only marking you, but he's trying to hurt you the other way. Yeah, geez, thanks for bringing that up again. I thought that I could. It was eight. What was he nineteen? I could have done a bit more. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, but that's horrible. Like in fairness, it's like it, it's the way the game's gone. Like you just have to keep chasing the other way. Now, look, it, it, there is exceptions. Like, to, like to an extent, like if if someone, if I'm playing the full forward line, someone goes to, to make a burst, and I know he's just dragging me back. He's no intention. To, like you, you only go so far, and then you have to pass him on because, like I like I don't need to be burning up my energy running back, doing like ten lengths of the field, and then you know when the ball comes in, then I've I've no energy to to try and score or whatever but um like there is in, even at club level like there's a lot of players who are like specific man markers who they probably won't even try to go up but it's more at county level that the formation gets so messed up like even like i was up at Derry and cork there last year in the in all Ireland court final and like like the players in the full back line standing beside the goalkeeper on, on the opposite side and then it, when when there's a turnover it's a complete flip on the other side like basketball like it's it's mad i would say well like the club football in Offaly anyway isn't um it, like the structure isn't as, as messed up. It is a small bit more traditional, like where teams will try generally to keep two and three up. Um so it's not too bad. Mm. I, I wonder um if Kevin Lochran had to score his one on one goal chance in the first half, that would have put Monaghan two four to seven ahead. If they had to get a bit of breathing room, why did they have had the confidence to go on and do something? I also noticed Jack O'Connor was sitting up in the stands, they kind of panned over to him a number of times. Bernie, where where do you stand on that in terms of like, yeah, like I mean, I like the idea of sitting in the stands, and I can totally understand why he'd do it. Yeah, I it, it, I suppose it depends on what type of a game it is. Uh, like if it was a league game, I think you could learn a hell of a, a hell of a lot up there. I I said it to you before, and a few people kind of half abusing me in the comments. Like I like being on the sideline, and I like kind of trying to give a bit of energy to things or whatever. That's I would see that as a a strength or whatever, whereas other people like standing back and making sure that they're able to see things, and that's maybe uh, a, stre- a strength of theirs. But if you're ever, if you're going to do it, it's probably now is a good time to trial it. Be interested and see what he does the next day. Be interested and see whether he does it in a championship game or it's just something maybe he's looking for uh, a different look at this time of the year, or can he see something different, or are they working on something specifically from the previous week that he wants to be able to see from a kind of a panned out shot or whatever. But I think it's kind of each, each to their own. I think it's whatever kind of suits you best and whatever the team benefits most from it. I'd say some teams like, like Liam Sheedy, Shane would never have gone to the stands. I don't think because he emanated an energy from the sideline. Same with Brian Cody. There was almost like an energy that maybe teams could feed off them. Then where there's other managers like Jim Gavin, Jim Gavin, there was no need for him on the sideline and he could have been up in the stand for every game because he never shouted anything and he was just standing on the sideline looking at things so you definitely do see a, a few uh a few different things up in the stands going to definitely see the merits in it yeah i'm just going to run through a couple of division two uh armada 216 me 10 i was watching back the highlights of that and like they were okay in the first half but me were shocking for a finish there and ended up you know losing comprehensively by 12 points is serious uh it's a serious job and Fermanagh beat Kildare, so Kildare, very impre- unimpressive start to the year, continues. Loud got their first win of the year, and, uh, you know, nice little boost for Jerry Brennan, 2-9 to 13 over Cork. And then Donegal continued their win and run, 13 points to 12 against Cavan away from home. Not an easy place to go, Keen. Like, what are you expecting from Jim McGuinness's team this year? Yeah, um, they were very impressive the first day against Cork, and even again yesterday. 
seen a bit of highlights, but yeah, I don't know. It's mad what it can do to a county like when they just get uh, a manager like him. I know every county doesn't have a Jim McGuinness, but like this time last year, like everyone was talking about Donegal when Paddy Carr left and Carl Lacey with the development squads and they were saying this is going to set Donegal back, you know, 10 years or whatever. And now it's all of a sudden, like in a couple of years, they could be up all Ireland contenders. But yeah, I don't know. Like a, a lot of people are kind of expecting like uh, new tactics or he's going to, what he's going to bring. I know he was out for a long time and he was uh, doing soccer coaching and that, but I, I don't think he'll bring uh, like anything really new. I think it's just more um, you know, the enthusiasm and the freshness and the intensity they're tackling and the way they're doubling up on players. Like, uh, to be honest, I expect them to win a bit easier than yesterday, especially after the, the Cork results. Like, I know Cavan are a good team, but um, I suppose it's just all about getting over the line now. But um, yeah, look, like th- th- Donegal and Armagh will probably come out too, and you know they've they've Derry in the first round of Ulster, so oh, it'll it'll be interesting anyway to see how it goes. Yeah, so, you, know, you mentioned you mentioned Joe Brennan there. He came out with a great line after the loud win. He said, "I wouldn't be licking myself too 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 much." So uh, he's obviously uh, he doesn't have uh, too much of an ego anyway when he said something like that. Good for them to get on the board though as well because they could there's a potential for there to be a hangover there post Mickey Hart and, and Gavin Devlin. So important to get points on the on the board in Division Two. Yeah, I also want to mention the fact that Tipperary got a win as well. Much changed this year to go up to Longford and win after losing a home to Carlo. You know, that, that's a nice little positive there. Is that two defeats in a row for Longford as well after winning the O'Byrne Cup again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they lost to Leash the first day out. Yeah. And, um, just on that as well, and you, me- you mentioned Leash, uh, mad, mad enough scenario there um, that Justin McNulty was in Starmount on Saturday at one o'clock and then left. With, without clearance, um, I think he was in some like picture or something at one o'clock, and then hey, left you've left the show many times a bit early. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm not in government. I'm not in government now, to be fair. Um, and he's obviously been suspended, and I know he's had a couple of high-ranking officials speaking in favour of him and this type of thing. But it's something I think we flagged in the show a couple of months ago that he hadn't actually got clearance from the SDLP to take over leash, and it's obviously significant mileage involved. Um, significant travel and a significant commitment so very very interesting to see how that plays out because you'd imagine something's going to have to give there and it's going to be very very difficult to balance the two especially given what's going on up the north at the minute and how kind of uh the, the, that situation and the time that's going to be required uh i suppose to resolve all that hmm. sounds like you want to do a political episode I definitely, I definitely do not. That's about that's about the height of it now. I could I couldn't go much deeper than that. But it's just um, it's it's funny. Like the GA is, is as political of an organization as you will get, despite what anyone would say. But this is one of the you know a time where like real politics, shall we say, and the GA are really kind of crossing swords. And it's going to be interesting to see whether a decision has to be made about what he's actually going to have to do. Is it going to have to be one or the other in time? Keen, we're going to put you on the spot now. The top five footballers. In Ireland right now, and obviously myself and Vernie are going to absolutely hammer you and look to see can we get you to switch around the order because you may have a one to five there, but you know we haven't signed off on it yet. There's a fair chance, Keen, that none of the players you pick in your one to five will end up in your one to five. <laughs> Hardly now, but fire away. Yeah, you put, put me in the deep end here. So yeah. this is this is top five current form based off the first two rounds of the league. So this is oh. not. That you're, you're going with the, just just with the league form, so you're ignoring. So it's going to be key. Not, it, it's based off the whole country, off the first two rounds of the league, not just the, the who's the best footballers in Ireland. Full stop. Okay, that's uh, I'll actually go with that because okay. it's kind it's kind of like who are the top five players at the minute? As in, if if a match is played tomorrow, we would want these five. I I'll, I'll go with that. That'll be interesting, and that's the way we'll we'll maybe treat it for the rest of the year. Keen, I'm start a- with number five, will you? Yeah, I might have picked that up wrong now, but uh, so uh, basically, just off the first two rounds of the league, whoever is performing, try, I tried to go throughout the country, but anyway, so yeah. five. Uh, so Killian Roach, the leash goalkeeper, he uh, he transferred from Clare 2021. He scored 10 points in the first two games, uh, at least one both their games, uh, three from play. Uh, so they beat Longford and Wexford. Um, he's playing in goals for UCD and the Sigerson as well. He scored two points uh, against the University of Galway, so they're in the semi-final this week as well. So, um, yeah, so I, there's a lot of forwards in here. So I said I'd give uh, Killian Roach the first spot. 
Yeah. Uh, just for just for a uh, like goalkeepers that are coming out and that uh, scored three points from play and ten in total. He's a serious left boot and he's knocking over forty fives there. So yeah, good start for Leash and for him. So I put him in at five. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Okay, that's a good start. Keep going, Keen. Yeah, four. Um, so this is for you, Shane. Uh, Sean O'Connor from Tip. Um, Lovely. So he's top scorer in the country at the minute uh, in football. 18 points from the first two games. Um, six from play. So I think he scored uh, eight points the last day. So he's on, yeah, UCC Sigerson team as well. Um, you know, Tipperary have had a tough few years since uh, winning the Munster, but... He's a young enough player, but he's a leader now, t- hitting the freeze. Um, and Tip had a bad result the first day and uh, got a win there at the weekend. So, yeah, had to put him in because he's top scorer in the country and he's playing Division 4. So, yeah, Sean O'Connor, number four. Just on that, Keen, exci- it's exciting the fact that he stepped up. Connor Sweeney's going to be back at some stage during the league and he's going to have a he's going to have a buddy that he can hop off in the full forward line, which will definitely help out a lot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so at least he won't have to get the the best man marker. Like if Sweeney comes back, you know, you're pushing it down the pecking order, and uh, he's a class player. Like I mean, he's won county titles with Clamell and that. And yeah, look, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I don't know if there's if there's many other tip lads on the UCC team. Like, but he's knocking out all the Cork boys and that. So yeah, he's a serious operator. Yeah, that's good. Full approval there. Yeah. So three, uh, Oren Murdoch from Down. So he's uh, scored two four in the first two games. Um, he was almost gone to the AFL last year, but he's ended up staying now. He's only 21. Um, he's an animal. He's big and strong. He's well able to move. So, um, yeah, he's going to be massive for Down if they're going to do something this year. So they've Down are actually top of the, the league table out of the, the 32 teams. So they've had two wins and a plus 22 score difference. So, yeah, so Or Murdoch from Down is uh, number three. Just on that as well, they got Keelan Mooney back as well. Um, he played a half the other day, which is a big. Like I think it looked like his um career potentially, let alone county, could be over. But uh, Connor Naverty seems to have coaxed them back, and I think he's fully fit. So they've um they definitely looked like they've gone from a position to not having lads committing to having you know a decent few riches available to them. And I know they were beaten in the in the Talton final last year. But there, there's definitely plenty more improvement to come from them by the looks of things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and like, like they're too good for Division Three as well. I don't know how they didn't go to Division Three last year. So, like, they'll they'll get promoted this year, and then the the Ulster Championship draw is kind of lopsided. So, um, they have I think Cavan and maybe Armagh on their side. So they could get to an Ulster final if they if they perform. So yeah, or Murdoch at three. So uh, two, I just put Sean O'Shea. So. Uh, yeah, we we just talked about him. So yeah, look, he scored twelve points so far. Um, like the first day against Derry, when the two Cliffords weren't there, he was still probably the only shining light. And then yesterday was or Sunday was man the match. So, uh, yeah, Sean O'Shea two, and then one I just went for Connor Glass. Um, yeah, he just can't do anything wrong at the minute. Like he's he gave one an, an all time great performance there in the club final, and then comes back. Um. Straight after six days, you know, captain's very two wins out of two in Division One. You know, he gets engaged, he puts a, a goal in top corner with 14 Tyrone boys in the way. So, yeah, absolute but, pox of a goal. And he admitted so, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, he, he didn't mean a bit of that. I don't know. Like, people on Twitter are saying, Did he mean it? Like, so, how, what would you be like from that far out with that many people in your way? Like, stop. Yeah, yeah, but he's something else, isn't he? Like, and he's taking a bit of a break now. Um, he actually just, he think he's gone off to the sun for for a couple of days, but like it's 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 some like this will be unforgettable a part of his career no matter what happens from here after. Like it's been a mad couple of weeks, hasn't it? Yeah, ah, oh, stop. Yeah, I'm sure he was on the podcast there during the week, like, and then he just rocks up to the match, and he's just he's so kind of down to earth, and he's so relatable. I think even Mickey Hart took him off there a couple of minutes to go, and so the, the reception he got, like, he's just. He's early, like he's a legend at this stage, and he's only what 25, 26. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, even I remember we played Derry in Division Three, was it must be three years ago at this stage, and like the to just the physique of him, like he doesn't actually look um like bulky or anything. He's, he's almost like there's no there's no muscle on him, but at the same time, all of our lads were bouncing off, like so. It, I just I don't know if it's the AFL training or the professional, but like there's no like, he's no body fat at all, but. At the same time, he's he's still able to ride challenges. Like it's 
yeah, no, he's, he's some operator to be fair. He's the he's the prototype modern footballer, isn't he? He's I would say like he's not big and bulky. He's really wiry, like and you would as you said there, you just hop off him. He he doesn't have a load of bulk in him, so he can cover all the ground that he does as well. Like if like real realistically, if you were building probably the perfect midfield pairing, it would probably be him and Brian Fenton, and they're both big lads. But they're not like huge. They don't have biceps bul- bulking out of their jerseys or anything like that. They're both able to get up and down. They're both able to kick scores. They're both brilliant defensively as well. Yeah. No, that's. I tell you something, Keen. That's a fair. That's a fair list now. It's gone down well in the comments as well. Trump Spieler says brilliant list. Adrian McGrath says this lad just earned a permanent spot in our game right there. <laughs> Jokes aside, that's a brilliant, well thought out list. So, Keen, it's gone down well, and I'd be embarrassed to try and argue with you. <laughs> yeah, I'd be the I'd be the same as well to be honest with you. Like, and you've obviously been keeping very very close tabs on Division Three and Division Four. So I I'm happy with that, and it's definitely something like maybe after four rounds, maybe after the end of the league, we look at again and just see how it changes and see you know there's there's Master Clifford and a few other lads force themselves into it. Just on that as well, Keen. Um, on the Cliffords coming back a little earlier than had been expected by all accounts. They were supposed to not play the first two games was the talk. What do you think of that long long term? I know they were strangling at the leash and they were mad to get back and Jack O'Connor probably welcomed them with open arms. But like, still, was it a bit soon to be bringing them back with the bigger picture in mind or what do you reckon? Yeah, I, I, I'd say so, yeah. Like, I, I think the, the more time they get off at the start of the league, the better. Like, I know Kerry probably just wanted to win, but... Like, I think these league games are largely irrelevant like when it comes to championship. Like I know Derry, like they want to win every game, uh, because they're only open Mickey Hart and that. But I think like there's such a long summer ahead. And I know like Kerry and Dublin will be able to taper it down after the league because like I know Kerry have to play Cork, but um like Dublin won't break a sweat in Leinster. And Derry Derry don't have that luxury, like so I think they, like they probably should have got, got a bit more time off, but look, they know themselves, but um like even with like the likes of Derry now, so they've like they're probably going to be in a league final now. So they'll play five more games and then the league final, they'll be six. And then they've Donegal in the Ulster quarter final. Then they're going to have to play Tyrone or Armagh, and then uh, Monaghan in the final or something like that. So that's what well, nine games and they win the Ulster championship and then they start into the All Ireland series. Like so, you just wonder like at so, like are they going to run out of steam? I know Mickey Hart wants to win every game, but. Uh, like when it comes down to it, it's all earned semi final time. Will like they're carrying Dublin probably have more players as well, and the luxury of tapering down the provincial championship. So, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to know. Mm. Do you think um, Derry can win the All Ireland this year? Like Mickey Hart last won an All Ireland in 2008. Is it going to happen again? I don't know. They're so close, like they're, they, they are, but it's just that thing about w- will they will they run out of gas? Um, I don't know. Like, there's a kind of uh, a perception about Derry that they're too reliant on Shane McGuigan, like, and it's, it's thrown around an awful lot. And to be honest, I think it's a bit lazy. Like, I think it's just someone has said that, and like, everyone's running with it. Like, because, like, when you think about it, like, n- like no doubt they are reliant on him, but he's he's probably the second best forward in the country. And like, so if like if if Derry are to win the All Ireland, like McGuigan needs to score, like uh, including freeze, probably six seven points. He needs to find three or four from play. And then, like, they'll get one, two from everywhere else. And then they're up to 14, 15 points and hope that they keep them, keep it out at the other end. But, like, it's the same for Dublin like, or Dublin and Kerry. Like, if if Clifford, like, if he has a quiet day like he did last year, Kerry don't win the All-Ireland. So they need seven or eight points out of Clifford, same way Derry do. Like, I, I don't think that that's the reason why why they can't win it, which everybody, like, if, if you look across the media, it's like, what do you think of Derry? It's like, two length on McGuigan, there's no, no scores outside of him, which I don't think will actually stop them winning the All-Ireland. What do you make, Keen, of um, just speaking about forwards? And I was just going to say, oh, do you think Dublin have the same issues with their forwards that they're somewhat reliant? But Joe Brawley, who, you know, he likes to make outlandish comments, but he said Dublin have basically turned Conor Callan from Diego Maradona into James Milner. What do you make of that? Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't really agree with that because, like, it, everyone was saying that this time last year about Dublin that, you know, no uh, people aren't afraid of Dublin anymore and this, but like, like the reality is their their first fifteen is still the best in the country, I think. And like they're gonna be around semi final and final time. So like I think writing Dublin off off a few league games is mad. But yeah, like it is it's a difficult one with Con though. I don't really know what's up with him. Um I don't think it's the way Dublin are playing. I don't know if he's just lost a bit of a spark. Like, because I know he was injured two years ago and like 
I think that he didn't he get one point from play maybe in the All Ireland final last year, and he has been quiet like so. I don't know as he lost maybe a, a bit of his um, acceleration with a few injuries or something, but he just doesn't seem to be able to to blow past lads like he used to. And um, like yeah. he, he chips a couple of points like like all the Dublin forwards do, but like do you remember him back in the day in 2018, 19, he was dropping the shoulder out in front of 45, mm. lads leaving lads for dead. So you don't really see that out of him anymore. Um, yeah, so I can see where he's coming from, really, with, with Con, but maybe not as a whole. Yeah, like, I mean, it's only four or five years ago he was saying about Con, it's not possible to give him a bad ball. And, you know, he has commented on an awful lot. And look, obviously, I've shared a dressing room with Con over many years. Like, he's he's one of these lads who just goes out there and takes a game by the scruff of the neck, and he's a leader. And I've, like, I, yeah, he's not absolutely destroying teams at the moment, but I've no doubt that he'll come good. And maybe part of it, too, is like, if you're playing in a top team that always gives you a ball on the front foot and you're tr- transitioning with pace and all that kind of stuff, you get more of an opportunity to run at lads one-on-one. Maybe sometimes, Keane, Dublin are a bit too slow and laborious bringing the ball up the field. So therefore, your starting position is facing uh, a blanket. And that can happen too. And obviously, it's going to be more difficult for a forward in that situation. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't get the kick passes probably that if he was playing with Kerry, he might because the- Dublin tend to run the ball an awful lot. And that's off what the opposition are doing as well. But um just on the on the Mayo Dublin game, um say on the the, the last play where uh, Ryan Ryan who put the ball across to, to Fergal Bowling, right? I think there's a lesson here for teams, right? So uh, Fergal Bowling puts over the points, right? So they're one point up and the clock was seventy three thirty. So and it was four minutes added on. So there's one play left really. And I think there's a lesson here for teams that if there's one play left and you're a point up, you should press the kick out. Because Mayo pressed the kick out uh, on Saturday. So the kick out went short. Killian O'Connor was there putting the pressure on. There was two or three hand passes. He ended up fouling them. I think it was Lee Gannon then kicked the free to Fenton. And by the time all that happened, it was 74 minutes. And then next thing, the rest is like game over. Whereas if you drop off the kick out, you essentially give the... T- like teams will drop back past halfway. So you give them the chance of getting an equaliser. Yeah. They're, they're up around your 45, hand passing it around. And you know yourself, a referee, you hit, you get a bit of contact, you hit the ground, all of a sudden you have a free to draw it up. And like, Armagh actually done that last year in the Ulster final. They went a point up against Derry, last play, everyone back inside the 45. Derry chipped the ball out to midfield, equalised the score, lost it on penalties. So I think if, if that situation comes up, I think teams will be talking about, you just have to be brave and press the kick out. If there's only 30 or 40 seconds left, if you can just hold that ball up there and burn up the clock, are even forced to kick keep keeper to go along because like at that stage of the game, like the pressure on the goalkeeper and the opposition backs to secure the ball and get it up the field, but you're essentially giving them, you know, a, a, a free out like to come up the field. So I just thought that was interesting for Mayo. It's like a natural inclination when you go on up to preserve what you have. But I I I'd, I'd agree with you. I think it's it's actually low. It's actually lower risk in a way. Like I know you're pressing high and maybe leaving more space. They're not like. Would you bring out the goalie so. as well, Bernie, if you're pressing it, you know, to have him cover one half of the pitch at midfield? Oh, you probably you probably would, Shane. Last minute of the game. Yeah, you pro- I'd say you probably would. Well, they're not going to go along then, and they're going to try and work a short one because they're so worried about going long. And um, like if the ball breaks and if it ends up in Mayo hands, the game is over. They're going to try and work something short. And you mentioned, uh, Keane, about Donegal against Cork. There's a sequence there where... Um, Cork went short and the press was so aggressive. It was brilliant. They kept making him, um, it was like real one-on-one stuff. It was really, really aggressive again. And it, in that sort of situation with 30 seconds left, it just can suck up that bit of time and it doesn't give them a chance to work the ball to the midfield and even float the ball in around the house or buy a free or anything like that. It really makes, it really makes the team that's chasing the draw or chasing the win earn what they're going to have to earn rather than, you know, potentially buying something or making it, you know, pulling the wool over the referee's eyes. So, no, I, I, I'd agree with you there. I think, and it was it was great to see that type of a thing as well. Mm. Keen, pretty soon we're going to have to catch you on and ask who's the top five footballers in the country, top five forwards, stuff like that, really put you on the squat and make you squirm, um, spot and make you squirm. <laughs> Would you be up for it? Oh, yeah, 100%, yeah. And even, like, across the weekend there, like, the amount of, the amount of lads that go through on goal and drive the ball straight at the goalkeeper, it oh. is... Mental. It is mental. Like I mean, it hurting as well, though, Keen. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but like I always like I do a bit of coaching there in the club, and I always say 
like the, the two probably best forwards to ever play the game, the Gooch and Peter kind of like pass the ball into the net, side foot, roll it in. Like the amount of lads who go through and just drive the ball straight to the keeper, like the harder you kick the ball, the less control you have over it. So I always say to young lads, is like if you're playing golf, you wouldn't take out the driver on the green. So like the amount of times you go through and you blast it and it goes straight to the keeper or you lose control and it goes over the bar. Like, or if you even uh, take the ball a little bit closer to the keeper and just drop the shot, it's so easy to go around the goalkeeper in Gaelic football. Like, um, do you remember the, you know, Brazilian Ronaldo, R9? Sure. He, I think he scored something like 400 goals in his career and it's over 100 times he took the ball around the goalkeeper. And Boy. He, yeah. And he was just saying, he, he used to say, like, how easy it is to take the ball around the goalie. And that's soccer. Like, in, in Gaelic football, you have the ball in your hand. Mm. And the keeper's coming out flat foot. So, I, I think a lot of people are missing the trick there. But, uh, like, a lot of the time, it's it's lads going through on goal who maybe don't practice because they say, sure, I'll never go through on goal. But, like, when all the top forwards are, like, locked, on, locked up, that's that's who ends up, you know, all of a sudden, you're, there's no one marking in your shoes. So, I don't... I don't know if, uh, if like, the full squad is practising um, stuff like that. But, uh, yeah. And do you know what it is as well? It's lads wanting to take the stanchion off the net and get this <laughs> unbelievable goal. It's like, as long as the ball crosses the line, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. That's all that matters. The ball, all that matters is the ball across the line. But lads are fixated with, you know, absolutely rattling the net. Whereas, as you say, I don't know if the Gooch ever really rattled the net. He just, he passed them beautifully into the net. He did against Mayo one year. I remember him cutting back on his left and blasting into the roof, but definitely keen across the board. It's, you know, he's passing to the net. Don't take out the driver on the green. I like that. I'll be using that on Keane. That's a nice one. <laughs> that is a nice one. Um, final thing before we finish up, go to the week. Keen, if you want to think there in terms of football, in terms of hurling, Michael, anyone standing out to you? Yeah, someone that we didn't mention at all, Shane, and we should have had. Connor Foley hit three points from full back for Wexford and is a relatively new face. Um, and he hit them from all different areas of the field, some going forward, one from distance definitely as well. He'd probably be my, my hurling goat of the week, um, and he's exactly what Keith Rossler is looking for, he's looking for a new face to stand up, and not saying he's going to replace Liam Ryan or anything like that, but he's an option, and he's mobile enough to play cornerback probably as well, and wing back. So it would be Connor Foley from a Wexford point of view. Jake Morris, huh? 1-4, sure look it. I don't normally give it to Tipperary lads. But <laughs> oh, no, 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 definitely not, definitely not. Team. Uh, yeah, I go with uh, Cormac Murphy from Derry. Mm. So, big debut. He scored three points, and just like that, we're on about uh, lads uh, chipping in for Derry. So, yeah, I think it was uh, he came off the bench the first week, but yeah, look, he looks like he's going to actually add to the first fifteen. Like he's not just there being trial. I think he's going to play a championship. Um, like Derry had, Derry had probably thirteen or fifteen. Owen McAvoy is the only one that's missing at the minute. And then, like Conor Murphy is, uh, I think is a starter. Like so, yeah, no, to be to be doing that this time of year, um, he'll probably get himself into the team for for the summer. Mm, okay, uh, Adrian McGrath says that this is about passing for a finish. There, that's a, there's another factor. Every other strike on a GA field is at a target. Scoring goals is the only time you are avoiding a target. So instinct has to come out of it. Just bit. quickly, Shano, before we go, um, and I, Keen, you probably saw it as well. That controversial goal in Cusick Park. Like ah, oh, like from a Clare point of view, that's a re that's a real killer as well. That could be the difference between promotion and middle of the table potentially as well. And from a Westmead point of view as well, and it looked from the footage I saw, it definitely looked like the umpires were not looking at where you know the eventual goal score was when the ball was being passed across. They were looking at the ball carrier at the time, but that's uh that's definitely a signal from a Clare point of view. Hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, sure. Like if if they won that or two from two, and they're looking at promotion, especially taking two points off Westmead as well, because that's who they'll be competing with. And after losing so many players and their manager, yeah, that's it's uh, it's very sick for them now. Yeah, absolutely. Look, that's it for the show this week. A reminder: we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. Use the promo code our game, and you'll get 50, uh, 15 percent off. Keen, thanks very much. Quite a, a debut from you. We'll be looking forward to having you back on soon. And Michael, sure look, we'll chat again on Thursday. So, man. Bye.